Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Great. All right, well, thanks everyone for coming to our sustainability meetup. Um, today we're going to be talking about some of the machine learning research projects that we've been working on the past couple months, specifically catered towards energy efficiency and customer care. Um, real quick, I'm going to introduce my data science team. There's Ben Packer, Zero, and Mark, and they're going to be coming up here and uh, presenting some of these with me. Okay. So first, um, I'll just go over the quick agenda. We're going to be going over the background about OPower along with what the data science team does. Then we're going to talk about some of the load curve archetypes that we've been researching. Then I'll talk about the small, medium business insights that we have. And then we'll finish it off with electric vehicle detection. <coughs> So I want to start with a small energy savings experiment that was done a few years ago with the aim to figure out what's the most effective way to get people to save energy. So they put these placards on people's front doors. The first one said, save energy and you'll save more money. The next one said, save energy and you'll save the planet. And the third one said, save energy and you'll be a good citizen. So which one of these three do you think was the most effective at getting people to save energy? Very good guess, but it's a trick question. None of these actually had any impact on energy consumption at all. It turns out that the only one that did was a fourth placard that said, your neighbors are saving more energy than you are. And even if that wasn't true, people still were so competitive that they actually saved money when they were given this placard. So that's kind of where the idea for O Power came in. And we decided to make a home energy report with the idea that if we were able to compare people's energy to their neighbors and actually inform them about their energy usage, then they have the highest chance of actually saving energy. So here we have a mock-up of our home energy report. And you can see the bar chart is comparing your energy usage to your neighbors and your most efficient neighbors. The neighbors here are going to be people uh, approximately 100 homes of a similar size within a, similar, or within a short radius of your house. And then along with this, we also provide tips on how you can save energy and more information about that. So this is our first big project, or product, the home energy report. Next is our behavioral demand response. So traditional behavior demand response required customers to actually uh, sign up for these devices that would be installed in their homes for, say, a $25 rebate. And then on the peak days, like the hottest day of the year, when everyone's using the most energy, and you would go to turn your air conditioning up, it would block you so that you wouldn't be using as much energy on these peak consumption days. However, because this requires you signing up to actually get this installed in your house, there was very, very low adoptability. So OPower went for a softer uh, program called the Behavioral, Dispons Behavioral Demand Response Program, where you actually will get a text message or an email asking you, hey, tomorrow's going to be a peak day. Please limit your usage between the hours of 2 and 7. And some of these programs will have monetary value, so they will give you a rebate if you don't use as much. And the adoptability is very high. All we need is your email or your, tech or your cell phone number, and we'll be able to send you these communications. And these are actually very, very effective. Um, without monetary gains, I want to say it was between 3 and 5% energy reduction. And then with the monetary incentive, it was a 10% reduction in peak energy usage um, on these peak days. And that's really important because for the peak days, if you run out of capacity as a utility company, you have to start up these peaker plants, and those often use fossil fuels, and we know those are all bad. So that is uh, OPower's second big product. How is it deployed in the wild? Well, we send a communication the day before the, or before the peak day saying, please don't use energy between these times. And then we also give you your neighbor comparison for the last peak day so that you can see that you could be doing a lot better, kind of give you that competitive, or competitive edge. Then on the peak day, we're hoping that you turn up your, air, your thermostat a little bit. So you turn down your air conditioning, you don't use as much. And then after the peak day, we'll send you a follow-up communication saying, great job, look at you, you are one of your efficient neighbors, way to go. So that's a little bit about <coughs> OPower's two big products. Um, now data science at OPower, here's some of our data science members. 
Um, it's a, a nice big team. We work on a variety of different projects, some of which we're going to be presenting today, and with the goal to deliver them to improve the experience either for the utility customer or the utility client or their customers. Um, a little bit of the workflow, we start in the research stage with an idea, we take some data and we figure out, okay, is there any signal with, in this data with these models? We try a bunch of different models and if there is signal, then we will, and if we actually can have decent accuracy, then we will move it to an initial rollout on a small population, either a single client or a small pilot program. If that goes well, then we will release it for general availability. And that includes all of the productionalization within that. And then after that, we will go back to the research and we will consider model improvements and we'll do more accuracy testing and then potentially go through the whole thing again for a V2. So today we're gonna be talking about some of the projects that we have in our research stage. We have two microphones. And a clicker. And, well, and a clicker. Are we good? All right, so I'm going to talk about, um, actually, before I begin, one thing Joe neglected to mention is that today is the six-year anniversary of Justine graduating high school. And the only reason I say that <laughs> is because she didn't want me to say that. Thanks, man. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about, um, this is actually something in, that we do have in production. Um, using AMI data, smart meter data, to uh, segment customers, understand their behaviors better. So I'm going to start with my own data. I live in Redwood City, and this is a monthly view of what my electric energy usage looks like. Um, so this is, for each month, the average usage in my home. Um, and you can see that I use more energy in the winter. And actually, when I first saw this, I was a little surprised, because you would think in the summer you use more electricity. Um, but actually, I don't have, since it's Redwood City, I don't really have air conditioning, don't really need air conditioning. And in the winter, that's when we blast up the heat. We also have some uh, not great insulation, so we use a little too much uh, of the heat in the summer. Even though, it's, even though it's gas heat, we're still using just more um, energy in the system in general. Um, anyway, so this is what my, what my profile looks like. Um, this doesn't tell you that much about me or um, really about my behaviors. Um, but if we dig into the, I have, since I have AMI data, we can look at that and see what that looks like. So what I'm showing here is across the lifetime of my home or when I was there, for each hour of the day, what is the average energy usage, electric energy usage? Um, so each hour, this is just the average, my average usage. And so what you can see, you can see a few things here. First is that we probably wake up on, in general around 7. So there's a little, little spike um, in the morning. Um, someone is usually home during the day, so my daughter... Um, and our nanny are usually in and out of the house during the day. And then um, we come home in the evening, we have dinner, we watch Hulu or whatever, and then we go to sleep. Um, okay, so this gives you some sort of sense of what my life is like. Uh, a little weird, but it's fine. Um, it would be great if we can do this for the, uh, all utility customers to try and gain some insight into what their behaviors are, and then I'll, um, we'll talk about what we, what we can do with that. But I want to back up and just show you what data, raw data looks like. I don't know if any, everyone's seen this, um, but this is pretty typical of a single household's energy usage, electric usage for an a, from an AMI meter uh, for a single day. So one day, this is one random customer that I chose. Um, this is real data. Um, so you know, maybe there's some pattern here, maybe not. It looks a little noisy. If you take this, this customer and take the same plot uh, over five consecutive days, this is what it looks like. So each line here is a single day of usage, and this is five consecutive days. Again, pretty noisy. Maybe there's some pattern here. They seem to use a little bit more in the evening, um, but you know, there's a lot of fluctuation. And then this is over all time. So this is this customer's data over all time. Very noisy. Really, not much that you can discern here. Um, however, if we take the average over all time, then maybe you, you can get some sense of the pattern. Um, you do lose some information, but you can see, for example, that just like me, they seem to wake up around seven. They get a little spike in the morning where they're having their coffee. Um, and then they actually, kind of similar to me, you know, come home in the evening, maybe they're around during the day, and then they have, and they, they go down in the evening after they go to sleep. Okay, so let's take this average curve, load curve, and plot it for all customers that we have. Um, so this is just a sampling of 1,000 customers. Um, and we call, this, we call this chart the hairball uh, because it looks like a hairball. It's very, again, hard to discern any pattern here and derive any meaning from it. 
So what we did is we took all this data for all the customers and we applied a clustering algorithm to it. Um, so we're going to just throw this data into the clustering algorithm and retrieve from it uh, some number of clusters, salient clusters of people that are similar to each other and different from others. Um, and so here's what happened when we did that. Um, we get out these five different clusters. Um, and let me add some, some of the color to it so you can see it more clearly. So these are these five different clusters that emerge from this. And I want to emphasize that this is not something that um, we went searching for um, five in particular with these particular shapes. Um, and in fact, let me show you them separately so you can see what each one looks like separately. We didn't say, let's look for something with like two humps, uh, which is probably someone who leaves home for work during the day, um, or something up in the upper right corner where someone is using a lot in the evening. This is all naturally emerging from the data. Um, and five in particular is, we, we ran this for different numbers of clusters, and this is the one, uh, five was like the right balance between explaining the data um, and, and simplicity. Uh, we also gave them kind of funny names, Steady Eddies, Twin Peaks, et cetera. Um, we, so now, now we have these, and each customer now is assigned to one of these clusters. So there are some people who are Twin Peaks, there's some people who are daytimers, et cetera. And we took those assignments and we correlated them with demographic data that we have. So we saw, for example, that uh, daytimers, as you might expect, tend to skew a little older um, and have fewer children in the house. Uh, night owls tend to be younger apartment and condo dwellers. Um, you would assume that daytimers tend to be, uh, or may be more likely to be retirees. Um, so this gives you some sense of who they are. However, um, one thing that has really troubled us at OPower for basically the entirety of our existence is that we run all these energy efficiency programs. We want to figure out who, are, and, and they work very well in general. Every wave that we've ever done, we've measured rigorously with randomized controlled trials, and the savings are always between about 1.5 and 3% uh, overall savings. But we want to figure out who are the people who are most likely to save, because that way we can target those people and get higher overall savings. And we've never found anything. We've looked at all sorts of different demographic categories, age, income, even political leanings. And for any given uh, territory or utility, sometimes there will be some sort of correlation. But it never holds across the, the full population or across other utilities. So there's really been nothing that we've found that predicts higher energy savings other than higher energy usage. So that's, that's basically it. If you use more, you're more likely to save. It's pretty straightforward. And that's how we target our programs. And we've been unable to find any other subset of po the population to target until we had these load curve archetypes. So despite the fact that demographics alone does not predict uh, EE savings, and the fact that our load curve archetypes are correlated to these demographics, uh, demographic categories in general, um, the low curve archetypes themselves alone are actually very predictive. Um, and there's a strong correlation. So um, on the energy efficiency side, our, for our home energy reports, you see that the daytimers are, have a much higher savings rate. And this is this pretty significant um, difference in the savings rate overall. Um, on the demand response side, the steady eddies uh, really stand out as those who really save the least. And I think this is what's important to see here is that, so if you look at the steady eddies, um, what I didn't mention is that the y-axis is percentage use of, of your overall usage. So this is not absolute usage. This is percentage of your overall usage, which means that if you can, be, you can use a ton of energy or a little energy, it's just about the shape. And that's what puts you into this category. So you can have very high and very low users that are both steady eddies. And the difference between these categories is, is um, what the shape is. And in the case of demand response, what that means is do you have the ability to change your uh, electric usage throughout the day? Or are you willing to or do you have the ability to? And steady eddies tend to be people who don't. They don't have that ability. And that is why they are saving at a lower rate. Um, it's, they, they may have a huge amount of afternoon usage during that peak period, but they just don't have uh, either they're never home or they're always home. Whatever it is, they're not, they're not changing their behavior, whereas um, the evening peakers are really the ones who are able to change their behavior the most and save the most. So. Uh, real quick, what, let's see, I can do this in two ways. One is to guess which is the most, let's, let's do guessing. Uh, all right, what does everyone think the most common archetype is across the population that we've looked at? Twin Peak. Any other guesses? Steady Eddies. Steady Eddies. Evening Peakers, correct. 
on the third try. Evening peakers are the most. Uh, this, by the way, does vary by utility and you know, uh, geography. But across the population we've looked at, um, the, the twin peaks are actually I also That was my first guess initially when we looked at this. But those are actually less common. Um, evening peakers are more common. So how do we actually use this? So this is all in production right now, it is, which means that um, it's run automatically in any of our products. And we do more than just the home energy reports are able to have access to this property for each household that we have. So we can, if um, we want to set, have a campaign that's sending out certain communications, if it's uh, an, a refrigerator, refrigerator rebate program that, that a utility is uh, marketing, they have the ability through our, our BI tool to target just um, people in that particular or households with a particular archetype. It's one of the many ways that we segment the population, and this is now included. So you can now, um, our partners can now target by uh, these low shape archetypes. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we're, we're for demand response in particular, this, this has a very strong um, effect. And so we, have, we, we have now have the ability to target the demand response programs to the people who are going to save the most. So now I want to turn it over to Zeru, who has done a recent project extending this. Um, we basically got asked by one of our uh, partners to do a couple things. One is to look to show them what their archetypes look like in particular. Every utility thinks they're very special, and of course they're all very special. And they wanted to see what their archetypes look like. Um, and they also wanted to see uh, different seasonal effects. And um, they're, they're trying to craft their own time of use rates. And so they wanted to be informed by this. So I'll turn it over to Zero to talk about that. Mike. Um, so I'm, my name is Zero, and um, I'm pretty new to uh, machine learning and data science. Uh, it was nice of uh, Justin to include me into the data science team. I mean, my work is data science work, but uh, I'm actually a um, implementation engineer working at Opower, but I'm really interested in this sub uh, subject. And uh, I'm also very new to the energy industry. But I'm very excited to share uh, the progress of my work with you guys tonight. Um, and I apologize if you know my slides does not look so fancy as Ben's slides, which goes for you know sales presentation. But you know it's real work and my my real hard time. So <laughs> thanks. Um, all right, here we go. So here, um, yeah. So. My, my project is the load curve archetypes for a specific utility partner of ours. And here, to start with, I plotted three individual customers with their uh, an average hourly AMI data throughout the day. And as, a, as Ben mentioned before, we actually translated the actual AMI reads into the percentage uh, throughout uh, the daily percentage use. This way, we see the usage shift throughout, uh, as the day goes by very clearly. Um, as you guys can see, they are very different individuals with the different patterns. As the first guy is probably a average nine to fiver, as you can see the peaks around the morning, oops, a more uh, amount of the morning time and the night time, and during the day is relatively lower. And the second person is actually pretty steady. Um, as you can see, the, the difference between the percentage is only one. And the third guy, for some reason, they have some heavy duty energy use uh, in the morning. Um, so as we can see, only the three people right here is already really different. So how about more? So here we got the hairball again that Ben mentioned before, just with more colors, because I thought it was prettier. Um, so. Um, but you know, like here we can kind of see the patterns, kind of. Like during the morning time, we see kind of a peak, and then again, the night time, the evening time, we see a, like a lower peak, and right here, we, you kind of see a low curve. But in general, this is still pretty noisy. So how do we understand this better? We turn to machine learning. And in this specific situation, we use clustering. And uh, uh, particularly for me, I used the k-mean algorithm from uh, Psychic Learn. And uh, you know, for case value, we actually tested from 2 to 20. 
And finally, we found that when k is equal to five, it brings us um, the groups with the most distinctive uh, characters. So here's what we found. We got this very nice five curves. And um, you can kind of see, oops, sorry. Here, we actually got the steady eddy that Ben mentioned earlier uh, as the purple curve. You can see it's pretty steady throughout the day. And also, we got this red curve over here, which is kind of have the twin peak, and especially at night, like it's, it's a lot higher. So this is the night owl. Um, so we do see some similarity like with Ben's general curves. but. Um, What's interesting is this light blue curve we see right here. This does not look similar with any of Ben's curves, um, which the energy usage is actually concentrated between you know, nighttime and morning time, and throughout the day is pretty low. So this might worth more investigation and research later on. Um, and also, we can kind of see on the right, I put the percentage of the customer that falls into different groups here. Uh, interestingly, you know, for the steady eddy, the group is the biggest. Because I remember some, some of you guys guessed earlier, like which one is the most common. But apparently for this specific utility uh, partner, the steady eddy is the most common type, which might have something to do with the region they are at, maybe they're just more retired people, but I'm not gonna say the utility name, obviously, but you guys can have a guess. Um, but you know, despite the difference between you know, my um, project with Ben's um, general research, um, we can still use all these um, five different types to uh, generate more insight so we can get better um, population segmentation as Ben showed you guys earlier so that using that we can target our, um, we can uh, use better target for our energy efficiency programs. And also uh, as Ben mentioned that we can have better energy efficiency savings forecast uh, more accurate. So now how about when we introduce seasons into the picture. Um, you know, the data I was using, I'm using for this project is from a region, I'm giving out a lot of details, but just without the name. Um, the, the region that, you know, this between, the change between winter and summer is pretty drastic. That's why we decided to introduce um, season into the cluster generating. And this is what we found. Um, here we can see between the winter curves and the summer curves, um, there is, it, they're pretty different. And the most obvious difference between these two is this peak. It kind of disappeared over here, but it makes sense. Like in the summer, the temperature probably rise a lot. And you know, between the nighttime and in the morning, like people just don't need to turn on the heat that much as they do in the winter. Um, so, you know, like using when we inter by taking into taking uh, weather into consideration in this research, we can actually adjust our um, program targeting uh, strategy so we can get better uh, result. So, so far I've pretty much covered all the progress I've made in my project and the next step I'm going to take is to see if for the same customers, uh, if winter and summer uh, energy com uh, consumption behaviors can correlate. For example, if in the winter certain people fall into this category, which there is a peak uh, between the night and morning time, um, when the summer comes, will they fall into this group or this group or both? Because, you know, like uh, when the temperature rises, they're not going to use as much uh, energy. So we will see as my project goes on. Um, so the conclusion is that clustering customers based on the AMI data brings more um, brings in more ways for us to identify behavioral uh, groups so that we can you know, A, target 
the utility customers better with our energy efficiency programs, and B, to provide more accurate energy efficiency uh, savings forecast. And last, you know, facts like seasons might be worth looking into. So that's it for me today. Thank you, guys. I'll see if I can answer. If I, I, I can't, I'll just look at him. <laughs> I was wondering if you have data to show um, the point, um, I mean, you've improved the cost effectiveness of this targeting. Um, and how, how much more accurate is your savings forecast with this targeting? Yes, that's actually another part of my later on um, research as we need to like, somehow validate if this is accurate. And that's a valid point. Are you talking about in general when we do these demand response programs using the general curves to target the programs? Sure, yeah. yeah, so we're, that's, we show the, the past correlation, we're now doing the targeting, and then we'll measure the effects, and that's not in yet. Yeah. Yeah. When you do this kind of clustering analysis, um, are you just using like a standard Euclidean distance measure? It's roughly, I mean, it's almost, it, yeah, we don't, there's not really, not too much extra complication beyond um, as we said, we take the percentage and then we do, do Euclidean distance. There's a few other versions of, of what we have, but the simple thing tends to work about the same as, as that. Yeah. Uh, between the different five different patterns, do you see a substantial difference in their total energy use? Yes. I don't. Re so, what I do remember is that uh, we, we have all this written down somewhere, and um, the, the ones that I believe stand out are that the Oh man, now I forget. All right, I think it's either day timers or the night owls use more. But but there's actually only two I think that stand out as either higher or lower. Um, and other than that, there's kind of a mix. And even when the ones that do stand out, there's a big mix. So I, I think it might have been the night owls who use more energy, but it's not consistent across the popula full population. There's a high amount of variation. There's definitely a, yeah still, so yeah. The difference in the means is not necessarily right. Right, and the reason, and so when I mentioned that the savings are higher or lower for each category, that's when adjusting for total usage. So we're, it's not just capturing the fact that higher users save more, it's even, even adjusting for that. Uh, yeah. We don't, so first of all, our, the way OPAR works in general is we partner with utilities and um, they have, so we run some of our own programs that they buy from us and then they also use a lot of our software or in this case the segmentation to run their own campaigns and programs. So what we've done is we've made this available. Um, I think the only thing that we've done internally is, uh, have investigated is targeting our demand response programs so far um, and there may be other stuff that we do. But we've given our utility partners the ability to use these um, low shape clusters as well as other uh, demographic or other pieces of information to segment the pop population and target their communications and campaigns appropriately. So there are, so I, uh, there is a New Zealand uh, utility that um, has recently started using them and I, sh I actually forget the program that they were using to target but um, we gave them the control to target uh, their marketing to whichever uh, archetypes that they found were uh, most likely to yield results. I think you had a question too. Uh, so, quick questions. Could you clar clarify um, the energy consumption percentage you mean is only electricity or like included uh, natural gas or propane? Yeah, so this is only electricity, and the reason is that we ha because we're looking at the hourly view, okay. we have to use AMI smart meters, and there basically is, I think, in the world, nowhere that has smart meters um, less than a day, except for like two places maybe that have um, hourly or sub-hourly um, smart meters for gas. So this is all electric um, smart meter. We could easily do the same thing. It doesn't matter what the input is. So we could easily easily do the same thing for gas. Um, but since you know, basically everyone who has smart meters has electric. That's that's what we do it for. Gotcha. So, um, sorry. So do you like include? So for this analysis, we're, we just use the raw data, the raw energy usage data um, as input to this clustering analysis. But as I mentioned earlier, we have, we have that other information at least sometimes. So for, depending on the territory, we get third-party information um, that we put into our tools that we have access to and that our utility partners have access to, and so they can use that to segment. And they, they do use that. Like age of home, sometimes they um, use to target, uh, you know, retrofit or whatever programs, um, and they use all, the, all those uh, properties of households if they're available. Yeah. Uh, 
could you discuss like the situation with like ownership in this in this kind of utility data? Like, I assume you you need to copy the data to to process locally. Yeah. Can you keep it afterwards for your own development? Will they ask for it back? Yeah. So, so, so this is a huge issue. The, the question is about um, data. Yeah. Sorry. The question was about data ownership in general. Um, OPower gets data from utilities, and what what do we do with it? Do we have to? I'm sure you're asking about security, and do we have to give it back and stuff like that? So we have this is a, again a huge issue at OPower because it's kind of central to everything we do. What we're showing is the data science part, but really everything that OPower does is centered around utility data, energy usage data that comes from customers through the utility partners, and there are huge privacy issues and legal issues. And so every uh, contract that we sign, we have uh, you know we have a huge legal team and a huge security team um, that we make sure we're com compliant with, and we have. Security on our side, it is on our side. So we are able to bring it into our data warehouse. Um, and then when, if we lose a contract or if the uh, contract ends, we have a deletion policy where we'll delete it. Um, and you know, we, we go through that pro we've gone through that process with so many utilities now that it's kind of standard. Um, and they have trusted us. And yeah. Yeah. Um, so in the beginning, you talked about the different ways that you could incentivize people. And it was like, behavioral way um, of like the competitors that drove them have you gone back and looked at the different archetypes if different types of incentives works best in different types of people yeah so the question is uh, do different incentives or different messaging as we showed at the beginning different messaging will affect people in different ways um, have we looked at the breakdown by archetype the answer to that is we strongly believe that there is something there and this is relatively new and we have a very strong ux and behavioral research a science research team that we kind of want to work with to figure out is there going to be different messaging and I, I think it has to be yes there are people who are home during the day should be messaged to differently to accept to you know participate in different programs differently than people who are not home during the day or you know have different patterns of usage, um, but that's still sort of in in, in research. Yeah, next talk. Um, I want to let's get to the other talk. So let's defer more questions till the end, um, and we'll turn it. Uh, who's next? Over to Justine. Over to Justine. my slides. Okay, cool. So I'm going to be talking about some of our small and medium business insights that we use to classify business types. So we have two big products with small and medium businesses. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, one of our first products at Opower were the home energy reports. Well, for businesses, we're doing the business energy report. And here we have a lot of the similar uh, modules as our original home energy report. Um, and we are comparing these uh, companies to competitors. So here we've got Osha Thai. It's around the corner. Uh, it's an Asian restaurant, Thai food. And we want to compare it to other Asian restaurants with similar hours in the similar, loc similar location because that is the best comparison. So we need to know from the restaurant name what kind of business, or from the business name, what kind of business segment is it so that we can actually compare it to restaurants. We don't want to be comparing Osha Thai to a Walgreens, basically. So that's one product. And then the second is a lot of tips, targeted tips based on the industry and the season. So I have some examples here from some tips that we gave to a healthcare center for how it can use less energy in the wintertime by using less heat. And so we want to target these companies or target these businesses based on their business type so that we can send them tips and we can compare them to similar businesses. So the first project that I'm going to talk about is the business type prediction, where the goal is to classify the business as in the business type. So we have 490,000 businesses from DMB, and those all have ground truth on their business type. But though, and that's a very small segment of the business population, and that's why this is an important problem. So on these unseen businesses, will we be able to predict the actual business type. There are 10 business types, and all listed here. And the way that we approach this problem is we're going to treat the business name as a bag of words representation, where we take the business name 
and then we actually break it down into a feature vector where a one in the vector indicates that that word is in the business name. So we have a high dimensional sparse feature space and uh, representing the word names. The idea here is that businesses with similar words in their names are going to be within the similar business type. We tried a lot of different algorithms on this just to see which one worked the best. A lot of your main players, SVM, logistic regression, we threw naive Bayes in there because why not? And, um, and it did pretty well. So this is the ROC curve for our logistic regression. You can see the area under the curve is quite high, um, even amongst all the classes. We do very, very well with religious organiza organizations with a 99% or 0.99. Uh, you can imagine that a lot of those religious organizations are going to have like church in their name or synagogue or something along those lines, and those are all going to be grouped properly. And then overall, here is how our, the different classifiers did. Uh, for this project, we really, really wanted to limit false, the false positive rate. We do not want to be comparing a restaurant to an office or something along those lines. So the metric that we really cared about was this one versus all true positive rate at the 1% false positive rate. And for this analysis, the best one that we had was this random forest here. And with 70%, this is good enough to continue on and actually start using this and productionalizing it. Pardon me? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So we are doing the one versus all. So predicting how, if we can classify it versus all. Yeah. Any other questions about this? The micro versus macro is a small distinction on the uh, accuracy metrics. Basically, the micro, oh, I'm going to say this wrong. The micro is, the, is evaluated over all, or is evaluated per uh, class, and then the macro is averaged over all. Is it yes. Number of, like, like it depends. It, the denominator it changes whether it's like the number of classes or if it's the number of examples. Yeah. Um, it yeah, we can talk about that afterwards. <laughs> okay, and then the next, um, the next big research project that we did for the small medium business insights was predicting their open close hours. So this is really important if we're going to be comparing these businesses to each other. We don't want to compare a bar that closes at 11 to a bar that closes at 4 because they're going to have very different energy usage and it makes sense for their use cases. So the goal is to predict their open and closed business hours. We had a data set of 26,000 businesses with, that both had AMI data and had ground truth data. I think you just leaned on the lights back there. Thank you. Um, and so, yes, we need AMI data for this and we also need the uh, open hour ground truth. We got that from Factual. We're using the AMI data here because we actually need to know what their usage is um, per hour. That way we can figure out when they're not in business. So here we have two business types, one that is open during the day, one that's open during the night. It's pretty easy to tell that they are open at that time. And if, if we could just eyeball all 26,000 of these, it would be relatively easy to say, okay, this one open, it's open at that time, this one's open at that time, or closes at that time. So we used a relatively straightforward algorithm. We started at the, um, the time, the minimum average usage for that business in one day, and then we took a step forward and a step backward until we reached a certain threshold. So in this example, it's 25% uh, it was the threshold that we used, and therefore we had the predicted open and predicted close hours that you see there. Any questions on that algorithm? It's just a simple walk. So then here's two examples of day and night businesses that we predicted. We have the times here of when we predicted them. And then we also have this little waste usage here. That's the yellow usage, either when they're ramping up or ramping down. This is a really great area for us to go in and send this company some tips saying, hey, you're using a lot of energy ramping up for the day, or hey, you're using a lot ramping down. Here are some ways that you could actually limit that. 
And so here are the results. We tried or we optimized the threshold percentage using the XNOR accuracy. What that means is we only said that it was a correct classification if we predicted closed and the actual business was closed or open and the actual business was open. Um, and we were able to get 75% accuracy using a threshold of 40%. So that's 40% from your minimum to your maximum usage. And over here, this is the plot that we used to figure out that threshold because at 0.4, our accuracy is the highest over our two metrics. And you can see performance is relatively stable across the different threshold values. And then I didn't have room on this slide, but this algorithm steadily beats the, the baseline models of predicting always open or always closed. So this does very well. 75% accuracy means that we can go forth with this project. Okay. Any questions about small, medium business insights before I pass it to Mark? Yeah. So the factual data is not available for everyone. So that's the problem. So we only have 26,000 um, actual open close hours through factual. There's a lot more companies than that. And so we need to have a method like this where we can fill in all of the gaps. Any other questions? Yes? 75%, why that? Why 75%? Yeah, why not 90? Well, that's the dream, right? But we. Well, no, I'm saying we were able to get 75%. That. You went forward with the project because of 75%. Yes, yes. Well, like, if it was 25%, then we would not go forward with the project. Are you, are you asking, like, was there a threshold that we needed to pass? No, there was not. Yes. And just to clarify, the threshold is the difference between the minimum and the maximum energy, or the. Okay. Yes. It's the horizontal line. It's the yeah, exactly. Minimum. So there are a lot of issues when you start getting into, like there are challenges when a business goes cl is closed during the afternoon, say. Then this simple algorithm breaks down because we are only finding the one part where they're closed. We're not looking for multiple close times. So even though it is the 40%, that's in the minimum. So for example, this business right here looks like it's closed two times a day, right? Maybe between like zero and three, and then also between nine and 18, it looks like it could be closed twice, but we're only predicting one cl open closed. <coughs> so our accuracy is going to be much lower for this. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, the accuracy number is one thing. I'd be more interested to sort of see, you know, error first time versus second time. Do you have a confusion matrix that you guys are looking at? I do have a confusion matrix, and I didn't put it in the slides. Um, yeah. Like, had to do with the overlap of what we predict open and close with the real and right. the card index. And that's how we really made a decision that this is good enough to go forward. Yeah. What is the most efficient, energy efficient cuisine? <laughs> <laughs> Probably raw. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just if you don't have to cook anything. Yeah. Okay. What was the name of that? Okay. Okay. Thank you. And then we'll give you flexibility as far as we can so you can find something that you agree and find the solution. Okay, interesting. We should take one more on this and then we'll Okay, I'll take it in the back because you've been holding your hand up for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, you. <laughs> Have we? Answer, do we? But not in this room. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we measure it, obviously. I just don't know the answer to that. Yeah, um, the problem is we, data we scientists, don't measure it. Someone knows it. We'll have to get back to you. Yeah. Does it work at all? Yeah, it works. It definitely works. 
I mean, but at this point, we've sent out a lot fewer of these business communications than we have for the regular home energy reports. So it, it is kind of a sample size issue. It is also a harder problem. So I mean, I, I do know that generally, I don't know the numbers of what our savings are for businesses versus residential. Um, it is a problem because of the heterogeneity of, I mean, it really like, it, they don't like it when they are compared to the wrong type of restaurants and mm. they completely ignore it. There's another much bigger problem, which is that people who receive mail at a business are very often not the people who are using the energy or responsible for using the energy or even the people paying the bill. So that is obviously in residence. Yeah, that's what we get this bill, one. You get this thing in the mail and you're like, oh man, I used to save energy and then you tell your family. You get yourself. this guy. For a business that is very disconnected and so we have that problem of outreach. Uh, it's, a lot, it's a lot worse. It's a lot, it's a lot harder there. Is there any uh, the correlation between this kind of segmentation and the kind of archetype long-term? Uh, we haven't looked at that at all. The, the, different, the correlation between Archetypes and business types is uh, completely separate. Uh, we should move on to Mark. Yes, all right. On to Mark. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Mark. Um, like Zero, I am not a data scientist, but I'm working with the data science team. Um, I'm an implementation engineer, also like Zero. Um, so what my project has been focused on uh, electric vehicle detection. So first off, why do we want to detect electric vehicles? Um, well, electric vehicles take a lot of energy, and when people get home at night and just plug their car in after work, they're putting a strain on the grid at a time that's very bad for the grid to be taking that strain because people are coming home, turning on lights, turning on radios. Uh, TVs and whatnot. So um, the utilities are very interested in trying to deflect that usage out to late to later hours, um, overnight in particular. So um, here's a. So what they what they do is that they have electric vehicle rates that people can sign up for. Where um, let's see, do I have a? Um, well, you can see there um, where people pay a slightly higher rate uh, during the day uh, in order to get a deeper discount at night when they charge their car. Um, so obviously, um, utilities are very interested in this data and finding out where uh, EVs are. And so uh, not only to encourage those people individually to sign up for electric vehicle rates, um, we've heard anywhere from a third, only a third to half of customers are actually signed up for EV rates uh, that have EVs um, from the utilities. But also to uh, prepare sort of on a more uh, global scale uh, for increased electric vehicle adoption, if there might be some need for additional transmission in certain areas, if there's neighborhoods where people are buying lots of EVs, or potentially to uh, in, uh, install charging stations. So um, so what can we do? Well, um, the, the easiest thing to do in the, the sort of just a proof of concept kind of what, what we'll call the first pass uh, attempt in our model is to just look at customers. Um, we have customer data for, for one utility um, where they have customers on electric vehicle rates. And uh, we, we have about 15,000 customers in that data set. And then to balance that data set off with uh, non-EV customers, uh, we just selected an equal number of customers um, that are um, on the standard uh, rate for that utility. Um, and, and just to make it so that it's somewhat coming from the same area, we looked at the number of EVs per city and then selected only from the top cities for our non-EV customers. Um, and as I said, we're just going to, for simplicity, include only the electric vehicle rate data after they've signed up for the EV rate. So as you could expect, um, we're gonna see the effects of the pricing on the data. So let's just take a look at all EV customers average hourly usage and compare that to non-EV customers. So that's what we have here. Um, you can see that uh, the electric vehicle rate for this utility kicks in at 11 o'clock um, and there's a, a huge uh, signal there. Um, as people turn on their, uh, their cars to charge, they probably have timers um, so, that car, so that the vehicle starts charging precisely at 11. And then over, to, over the night, more and more cars get fully charged and the, the usage drops down. Um, but we see that very clear signal that is very distinct pattern from the average non-EV user. 
Um, one thing you might notice is that not only is the shape very different for EV customers, there's also a huge magnitude difference in the total usage. Um, and so that was somewhat surprising. So what I looked at is just the distribution of total daily usage based on for EVs and non-EVs. One thing you'll see, and this is due to the electric vehicle itself, is that the peak is slightly shifted forward for the EV customers. But more the reason that we're seeing this high jump in average is that there's this long tail and it keeps going on. I didn't, I cut off the graph just for clarity um, of very, very high users. Um, and that's just because people that own electric vehicles are, are rich. And so they use a lot of energy. They have big houses. Um, and so we're having a demographic shift in the EV versus non-EV customers um, that's causing that, that disconnect there. Um, and, but it's important to note that that although you do have this long tail, there are a lot of EV customers that have a total usage that is very comparable to uh, non-EV customers. So you can't just use total total daily usage as a signal to somebody uh, to somebody that has an EV. That would be uh, uh, yeah, I'm blanking on the way to say that a, a correlation, not a causation. There we go. Um, so. So that's one thing that we can do. We can do a machine learning model, and I'll show you the results of that when we're only using the electric vehicle data after they've signed up for their electric vehicle rate. But that's kind of cheating because we already know that the price signals have shifted their usage out to a very specific time of day, and we're gonna and we're gonna take advantage of that. Our machine learning model is gonna learn that, and then um, we're gonna be able to predict people that have EVs because they're signed up for an EV rate. Um, so. It would be great if we had, sorry, if we had a third party data source that said these people own EVs but are not on EV rates. We didn't have that readily at hand. So what we decided to do was Joe to, wants to give us that right, that would be great. <laughs> Bring it on. Um, what we decided to do was look at EV usage for customers before they signed up for their EV rate. So the idea is that the, the assumption there is that people switch to their EV rate after they've purchased their EV, and so they've started to, to charge their car, um, but they're not paying attention to the time of day that they're doing it because they have no reason to. Um, that's obviously an imperfect assumption. A lot of people are, know exactly when they're going to get their EV, and then we'll sign up for their EV rate to just perfectly coincide with that, and we'll always have that behavior. So we're going to have some misidentified customers in that case, but uh, it's, what we can, it's the best we can do uh, with the data that we have at the moment. So what time period should we use for this sort of look, look up window, the time prior to when people sign up for an EV rate, but um, are still hopefully, still hopefully have an EV? So um, I'll kind of step through forward in time for EV customers um, as we get closer and closer to their start date for the EV rate. So if we look f for, f far enough back, and it's really not that far, um, it's only just, you know, a month before, in that in the sort of second month before they sign up, we can see a very similar load profile um, for the EV customers as compared to the non-EV customers. Again, with that shift upward um, because of the total usage. As we move forward in time, um, we can start to see that their usage in the evening hours is increasing and also overnight, and that we're starting to get this um, bump here. And um, of course, even if people are in, not incentivized to charge their car in the, ver in the very early evening, you know, at a very specific time, they will still have char their car charging overnight because it takes a while for a car to charge and they come home and they plug their car in. So that's why we're still seeing this signal here. It's just not quite as strong as we see it as we move forward in time. So now, in the turquoise here, what you see is them just in the two weeks prior to when they sign up to their EV rate. And we're starting to see not only are they charging their car at night, but they're already starting to adopt that behavior of plugging their car in at 11 o'clock. Um, and then once it gets to the point where they're after they've signed up for that EV rate, th th that signal's much clearer. Yeah? Yes, of course. Well, more and more people are, are, we have certain people, we don't know that everybody, you know, as we move forward closer and closer to that EV rate, um, that EV start date, more and more of those customers are on, have electric vehicles, and so they're, they're, the total usage is, is changing, yeah. Um, so to kind of strike that balance between we think that the customers have an EV at this point versus they've already changed their behavior in anticipation of the EV rate. We chose this kind of two-week window here between 15 and 30 days um, prior to 
when they sign up. Um, and just as a sort of further verification, um, what I'm showing here is just, again, that total daily usage histogram. And you can see that the people that are, that the distribution after um, they signed up and the one in that 15 to 30 day windows has reasonably similar shape. So um, they're, we're not getting, um, we, we have seen most of those customers switch over to have an EV is, is what that's telling us. Okay. So we used a logistic regression model, and um, we just looked at these average uh, usage by hour, the ones, the data that I've been showing you so far, no additional features at least to start. Um, and then when we just looked at the sort of, the, the sort of baseline accuracy where we just have a 50% 50, 50 threshold, um, we see that our, our, what we call the first pass, where we're only using the data after their EV start date, um, we get very good identification results, almost you know 78%. Um, and then we certainly have a decrease, but we're still getting a, a fairly decent match rate um, for uh, the, the customers when we only are using that data prior to when they signed up. Um, and we can dig down a little bit further and look at our precision recall curve and our ROC curve. Um, again, um, we're, we're certainly losing some precision as we, as we have the sound experiment um, as compared to that first pass model. But um, the, if we start to say we want to have, for example, say an 80% precision, we can get you know, an, close to a 60% recall um, for uh, the sound experiment. So that's certainly worth uh, pursuing further. And um, there's a possibility that, again, you know, some of these customers that we're calling EVs for, in the sound experiment actually don't have an EV yet because they don't sign up for the EV unt until they actually have their car. So um, that's, that's all I have for now. Yes. So doesn't that like um, introduce some kind of a sampling bias? And like, can we correct for that, or assume that like it's the same? Like that sample represents the underlying behavior of the rest of the. I see. It definitely does. So the question was, does, yeah, the question was, does uh, the question was, does the fifty-fifty uh, split between people that you don't introduce a bias? And of course, it does because much less than 50% of people overall have an EV. Um, this is just very preliminary. So we are not, we haven't even looked at this, how this looks at the rest of the population um, where that bias would be horrible. Um, we are just giving our, we just wanted a very simple experiment where we could say, can we do 50-50 to begin with? Um, and you know, 60% is reasonable, but it's not, it's, you know, it's not that great. There's plenty more work we can do. Mark really just started this project. Um, we can look at time series stuff. He's just looking at overall, uh, average hourly. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that we can do. Once we get good enough um, on just this very simple experiment, then we'll start looking at uh, what assumptions can you make to unbalance the bias um, to, uh, to get the right to, to, to actually guess in the wild who has an EV and who doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. And just, uh, an anecdotally, I've noticed that uh, a number of EV owners have solar PV. And I don't know whether, I don't know the tariff interaction about whether or not they're eligible. Yeah. In particular, this particular population, that we haven't done any sort of cross analysis to see if they do have PVs, but we have done that in the past, and there is a definite correlation between yeah. customers that, yeah, yeah. It, that is statistically significant, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a high correlation, and this analysis doesn't account for that, um, but some of the previous analysis we did, we just subtracted it out or excluded solar for two reasons. One is that we want to disambiguate the signal, the hourly signal, to make our jobs easier, which is a little cheating because in the wild you can't do that, but also, um, because the rate is difficult. Like, yeah. you, know, you can't know that this person that has an EV because they might be in solar. Um, when we deploy in the wild, we will then have to re-account for uh, that complication. Um, so, so for the bar graph, um, this is the, oh, sorry, um, that one? No, sorry, the non-EV customers have less usage. That's the total daily usage. The peak is, 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 is lower, and that's more usage. Um, sorry, yeah, sound experiment was just kind of the, the word we used um, to just talk about the, the data set where we just took that data prior to their, the electric vehicle start date, uh, the electric vehicle rate start date. Um, and so that was just kind of how we were referring to the two. Yeah? I'm actually a question for, for all of you. It's been stirred by, it's my understanding of machine learning. So it seems like you're taking a snapshot in time of data. But to me, the machine 
machine learning part of the topic would be as you get more data over time, your algorithms are getting better at organizing people into your groups or to find the right vehicle or to find the TV system or find a pattern or a result from your intervention. So I guess really for all of you, are you taking this and then once you get more data, are you using machine learning to learn better users? Uh, yes, basically yes. So during okay. what, what we've shown you is research. So these are some recent projects where we, for simplicity, during the research phase, we take a snapshot of the data and do some experiments on it. One, as Justine showed at the beginning, once we're ready to deploy some or strike gold or whatever, we productionalize it. It goes into production, and we basically retrain all of our models on whatever cadence makes sense. So sometimes it's monthly or um, more often, depending on uh, the data that we're dealing with. Um, so for like something that's based on building data, this generally only needs to be updated um, at, at most once a month because builds are only coming in even once a month. Um, and other things are more often or uploaded into a month. But yes, once it's in production, we are generally like rerunning these things to take advantage of the continuing data that's coming in. And it's getting better? And it's getting better. I mean, we, we, we have only recently uh, started to measure some of these things um, to measure the accuracy. So it hasn't been a long enough horizon to see a very clear trend. Um, in general, in machine learning, the more data you have, the better things are. Um, and also, the more recent data, the, the better things are. So it, uh, it, should, it should be the case we don't have uh, a ton of data to back that up yet. Maybe just two more questions. Okay, two more questions. Um, have you tried to sort of guess at what type of model EV that they have based on this? Because so the Teslas mostly will be on this range because they have the 85 to 100 kilowatt hours, and then you can sell that marketing data to BMW. It's like, well, you want to be in this neighborhood <laughs> because it's a higher population. Uh, Justine has an interesting story about that. So uh, actually, we, you may or may not know, Full Power got acquired by Oracle. One of Oracle's uh, recent acquirers was Data Raker. They actually do the exact that exact analysis to figure out who's got a Tesla, who doesn't, and they have a bunch of uh, security problems, basically, from people. They are uncomfortable that your utility company knows that much about you, yeah. whether or not it's like what kind of model. They're in the crowd, by the way, if you want to talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then you can, you've had your hand up long time. Just to follow up on a previous question, I'm wondering how are you guys determining who has, where, where are the solar installations on, how you're finding out who has solar? So generally, uh, if you get solar, you have to tell your utility and you get on some sort of uh, rate, uh, solar rate. And we, through our utility partners, we get all that information. So we get uh, rate information for, uh, I mean, we get all sorts of stuff, including usage, energy usage, rate information, and sometimes demographics and other stuff. And so that, unlike the EV, where basically you may or may not be on electric vehicle rate if you have an electric vehicle, I think for solar, it's pretty much across the board. Um, you're going to have to deal with your utility in some way, and so then they know that information and they pass that along to us. You, you can't get the tax credits without the right. tie, and the only way you get the grid tie is with utility, so it's a huge issue. Right. Uh, yeah, so basically, if you have solar, your utility generally knows about it, and then we know about it too. We're running a little bit over, so I think we should call it a day there, but thanks very much to the Oak House.